for. Thank you guys for skipping Halloween and coming out tonight. I know it was difficult for some of you. Um, to come to listen to the, the book of Daniel as we continue to study. So um, Boris said last week that um, I'll be looking at Daniel chapter 7. I'm not looking at the whole chapter. So I'm looking at the historical part and then next week Boris will be looking at the judgment. And so we, as we were putting together our talks, when we came to Daniel chapter 7, we thought that it would be impossible to cover Daniel chapter 7 in one session. For me, Daniel chapter 7 is my favourite chapter in the book of Daniel, um, particularly the judgment scene. I think it's such a beautiful picture of what Jesus does. And so just a bit of context, does everybody have, does anybody not have a handout for this evening's presentation? We got some on the front seat just here, if you don't. Um, I guess when you're looking at Daniel chapter 7, um, it's pretty much right in the heart of the book of Daniel. It's halfway point, and it's bridging the historical and the prophetic, and I mean, it's, it's a really, I guess, you could say that Daniel chapter 7 is the chapter in Daniel that encompasses the largest amount of time in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8 isn't the chapter that covers the greatest amount of time because Daniel chapter 7, it starts with, Daniel chapter 8, sorry, it starts with the Medes and the Persians and it finishes with the conclusion of the 2300 day prophecy. But Daniel chapter 7, it begins with the time of Babylon and it goes all the way through to when the saints receive the kingdom. And so this is the, the longest out of all the prophecies in Daniel and it encompasses all of the prophecies of Daniel. Now, a lot of critical scholars, as Boris was talking about last week, a lot of critical scholars, what they do when they come to the prophecies of Daniel, we work from Daniel chapter 2, then go Daniel chapter 7, then we go Daniel chapter 8, and so on, all the way up to Daniel chapter 11. That's what we do with the historicist approach. Critical scholars, those that subscribe to the, the preterist understanding, they start from Daniel chapter 11 and they work back. Do you know why they start at Daniel 7 and Daniel 11, sorry, and work back. Because when they look at Daniel 11, they overemphasize the role of a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. And so they're overemphasizing Antiochus Epiphanes. And then so as you get to Daniel chapter 8, and then Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel chapter 2, they implant that understanding of Antiochus Epiphanes from going through the wrong progression. Does that make sense? And so that's why we start at 2, go to 7, and then go through that way. Because it makes sense as well, doesn't it? You start with the simpler and you work to the more complicated. So that's what we've been doing. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll jump into our study here this evening. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be here this evening, to study your word. Father, as I left to come here, I saw so many young kids going out trick-or-treating. And Father, isn't it sad that so many people are willing to engage in such activity, Lord? When, Father, we know that what we're doing here is eternal. And so, Father, we just ask and pray that your spirit may shut us in here this evening, that we might hear your voice, and that, Father, we may be able to discern spiritual things, things that truly matter, because everything else is just fleeting. I ask and pray that you may be with me and speak through me. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The notes that I've prepared for you this evening, I, um, is everyone appreciating the notes? I'll tell you what. When Boris and I came to the idea of having notes, we thought that it would be good. And then we realized how much work we we're making for ourselves. And I said to the, one of the teachers the other night, I said, oh man, how do you guys do it? <laughs> it's one thing to come up and speak, it's another thing to provide something for you guys to actually look at and read yourselves. So what you'll notice in the handout this evening is I've got a lot of direct quotes from a number of books that I've read. I've kind of spliced it all together and we're going to go through these and read these things together. So we're going to have a bit of an introduction to Daniel chapter 7. Like I said, this is the beginning of, I guess, the exclusively prophetic portions of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2 had prophetic and it had historical. Daniel chapter 7 is purely historical. I mean, prophetic, sorry. And so there's a number of links here. So there is a definite link with Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. And there's a number of evidences in the text that show us that these two chapters are in fact connected. And it's important for us to understand that they're connected because all of these prophecies are building on each other. What you will remember from Daniel chapter 2 when Daniel relates the dream to 
King Nebuchadnezzar and he starts with the head of gold. What does he say to the king? You are that head of gold. So it's not ambiguous who was the head of gold. It was the kingdom of Babylon. When you come to Daniel chapter 7, however, you don't see any, I guess, delineation as to who those kingdoms are. That's why we see the corresponding prophecies throughout the book of Daniel that help us. And so there's a number of links that establish that Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 are connected. Now, the first link is this. If you look on the first page, at the top of the page, we'll read it out. The first link occurs on the broader scale, the literary structure. Now, this is a bit of a loaded sentence, but I'll, I'll explain it. In the chiastic literary structure of the first half of Daniel's book, chapters 2 and chapter 7 are found in corresponding parallel locations. Now, has anybody heard of the scary word chiasm before? So I think it has to do with an X and the center of that, where it intersects is the focus point. Okay? Now, you find chiasms all throughout the scripture. And I find it so amazing that scholars come and study this stuff and they're discovering stuff that the prophet probably had no idea that he was incorporating into the text. But the Holy Spirit was speaking to them, knowing that these scholars would find these things later. You know what I mean? Like, it's the living word. Isn't it remarkable that you can study the scripture and you're discovering things that you hadn't seen before in the very same patches, passages you've read time and time and time again? It is alive. It's not a dead text. And so what we see here is I put a little, I guess, uh, a listing underneath that first link. You see A, B, C, C, B, A. Can everybody see that? And so this is what I mean by the chiasm. It's kind of like in a, in a story, maybe a plot line, as it kind of the story, you have your introduction, and then you get to the, the plot thickens, and you have your climax, and then you have your conclusion. The chiasm is the central focus point in the book that is being written here. Does anybody know what the central focus point is in the book of Revelation? The three angels' messages. It's the center point of the book of Revelation, and it's our mission as a church, Amen. In the book of Daniel, what is the center point in the book of Daniel? It's in Daniel chapter 7 for a clue. Judgment. Where the Son of Man comes into the judgment. Isn't that beautiful? Remember Daniel, the book Daniel means God is my judge. How good is it to know that God is your judge, not the Antichrist? Wonderful news. And so what you see here in this little chart is you see that A corresponds with A, that B corresponds with B, and that C corresponds with C. So Daniel 2 Therefore, we correspond with which other chapter? Daniel 7. And we see similarities in the text. They both have to do with fallen kingdoms. Daniel chapter 3 corresponds with Daniel chapter 6. They both have to do with persecution coming from kings. Daniel chapter 4 and Daniel chapter 5 both have to do with fallen kings. The first one is Nebuchadnezzar's madness in Daniel chapter 4. And the second one is Belshazzar's feast and his fall in Daniel chapter 5. Isn't it remarkable, these things that parallel throughout? And like I said, the chapters in, in Daniel, as we get to chapter 7, it's not chronological because it happened before Daniel chapter 6. Daniel received this vision um, during the kingship of Belshazzar. It's interesting, isn't it? So link number two. They both contain the same number of major elements. Daniel 2 brings to view a series of four beasts represented by four metals. Chapter 7 depicts four major beasts. So Daniel 2 has to do with four beasts, four images, sorry, four metals. Daniel chapter 7 has to do with four beasts. Same number. Chapter 2 has the fourth kingdom divided by an intermingling of clay with iron. In chapter 7, the division of the fourth beast is represented by the horns on that beast and the activity going among them. And isn't it amazing that right at the, I guess, the precise moments where you would, in history, see these things unfolding, you find those precise, I guess, predictions in prophecy. You go through the different metals and right at that juncture in human history where we don't just see, I guess, another kingdom coming onto the scene, but a division of that kingdom that came before, the kingdom of Rome, we see that outlined in the prophecy. And we see the very same division in Daniel chapter 7 with the ten horns. And I've heard people say that you've got ten toes in Daniel chapter 2, you've got ten horns in Daniel chapter 7. Link number three is that there is a specific language. And so, I'm not going to read out all this one, but in Daniel chapter two, you see the first image, or the first metal, sorry, the second, the third, 
in Daniel chapter 7, you see the first beast, the second beast, the fourth beast. Okay, so you see similar language explaining these beasts. Link number four, the fourth kingdom in both visions was represented by iron. So has anybody read Daniel chapter 7 in preparation for tonight? What is iron in the fourth beast? We know it's Rome, but where do you see the iron on the fourth beast? It's teeth. It corresponds with the long legs of iron in Daniel chapter 2. Isn't it interesting? Link number five, both the descriptions in these two prophecies also concentrate most upon the fourth and last earthly kingdom in their sequences. This underscores the importance of the fourth kingdom. This is what critical scholars don't like. They think this was either written after the fact or they try to explain it away by working from the end to the beginning because it so accurately depicts the Roman Empire in both of these two prophecies, chapters 2 and chapter 7. Link number 6, as far as prophetic imagery is concerned, the metals of the image in chapter 2 are listed in order of descending value but increasing strength. What does that mean? Descending, I always used to get this mixed up in school. Descending is starting high and going low. And so what you actually find here, you see the value of the head of gold is the most valuable, but then you get a descending value but an increase in strength. Think about Daniel chapter 7. What is the first beast that we see in Daniel chapter 7? The lion. The king of the animals. But what does that lion also have? The king of the air and the king of the land corresponding with the head of gold. Isn't it cool? Hey, you see all these kind of themes coming through. It's the living word of God. Um, and then it also says, the, while the legs of iron at the bottom of page one represent the might and power of the fourth kingdom. So good hearing you guys turn pages. It means that you're actually listening to me, which is great. The beasts of chapter 7 follow a somewhat similar pattern. The lion, which represented the first kingdom, is a kingdom, is known as the king of the beasts, but the crushing power of the fourth kingdom was beyond representation by a naturally known animal. When Daniel's in vision, the first one's a lion. He can put, I guess, an image to that. The next one's a bear. He can put an image to that. The third one's a leopard. He can put an image to that when he comes to Rome. He sees what it is doing, but he cannot describe what it is because it's something that he's never seen before. And just think about the Roman Empire for a moment. The Roman Empire is still with us. It's just not in its pagan form. It's in its papal form. Remember how you have the legs of iron and the legs of iron going to the feet of what? And so what comes after Rome is still Rome-like. It still has that vestige of Rome. And it continues all the way through until when? So that stone comes and strikes the image on the feet. So Rome continues to the end in a different form. It goes from a horizontal kingdom. You see this in Daniel chapter 8. It goes from a horizontal kingdom to a vertical one. Political to spiritual. And you see these themes coming through. And so just a bit of a description here. The first, second, third kingdom, you see that in the chart just here, corresponding with the medals, with the, the beasts that we see in Daniel chapter 7. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit more of the, the other stuff here. I'm going to skip um, item I here. But item um, the next one down, halfway down the page, you see these are some important informations that we need to actually stop and pause and comment on a little bit here because it has to do with some of the new elements that are added in Daniel chapter 7. What you will find in the prophetic portions of, of Daniel is you'll find that each prophecy as you go through from 2 through to 11, you will find more information being added that hadn't been added before. It's compounding on itself. And so this is the new information that we're going to find in Daniel chapter 7 today. And we're only going to have a look at some of the parts. The new information, I guess Boris is going to have a look at is he's going to focus on the judgment. But these new elements are the blasphemous little horn or the antichrist, the heavenly judgment and the fact that the saints of the Most High ultimately will possess God's eternal kingdom. So it's more complete in scope. Um, the next thing that's new is this. The prophecy of chapter 7, like those of the remainder of the book, was given especially for the people of God in order that they might understand their part in the divine plan for the ages. I just love that kind of thought. Did God need to give this prophecy to his people? 
the beauty about apocalyptic prophecy is that the Lord does nothing. You know the, you know the verse. Unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, prophets. At the heart of Daniel chapter 7, you see this great controversy theme. Possibly more so than what you see in any other prophecy. In Daniel chapter 7, you see the kingdoms of this world conspiring against God's elect. Then you see this individual that takes the place of Christ, that misrepresents Christ. He's the little horn, the antichrist of scripture. And I mean, if you just rewind the, the biblical narrative, the story, what was the first issue in heaven? It was a being who thought that he could be, I will ascend on the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. What was his name? It's Lucifer. And so this antichrist power is very Luciferian in his nature. And then how does God counter these false judgments of the antichrist? Well, he has a true judgment. But, but notice that it takes a little while before God has his true judgment. Does it take a little while before God intervenes in the great controversy? Because he has to let things play out, doesn't he? And so when things play out, the Antichrist is revealed for who he truly is, that when judgment comes, he is judged according to his works. And then as a consequence of this judgment, God's people receive the kingdom. I'm looking forward to that day. Okay? And so this, this, this prophecy is a prophecy that captures the doctrine or the, the, the theology of the great controversy that we have in Scripture. It's this battle between Christ and Satan, and guess who's often the, the bargaining chip in the middle? It's God's people. And Satan is conspiring against God's people, but God is in the process of delivering his people. And so... At the end of this new information here, and I'm just rushing through this stuff because I really want to get to the prophecy. There's this chiasm in Daniel, like I said, there's lots of chiasms. Um, and what you actually find here is you find at the heart, the center of the book of Daniel, of the chapter 7 of Daniel, is the judgment scene. It's not the Antichrist, it's not the different beasts, but it's the Son of Man that comes before the Ancient of Days. So if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to open with me to Daniel chapter 7. I know that was a bit of an introduction, but I thought there was some good information in there. Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to start in verse 1. And we're going to read the first three verses. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from one another. So there's a number of symbols in here that we need to understand what they're talking about. The first thing that Daniel sees, the first symbol that we encounter in Daniel chapter 7 is what? Have a look at verse 2. Or if you want to cheat, you can look at your handout at the bottom of page two. What's the first symbol that he encounters? The winds. So there's the wind. That's the first symbol. The second one is the sea, the great sea. And the next one are the great beasts. Turn over to page three. What do these four, four winds represent? You see four winds represented in chapter eight as well. Okay? So... Four winds being from the four points of the compass doubtless represent political activity in the various parts of the earth, war and bloodshed, those types of things. The great sea, what does the great sea represent? Well, if you look at the Bible and you let the Bible interpret itself, in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15, it says, the, the waters where the harlot sat are peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues. So a large amount of people. The four great beasts. The application of the symbol is not left to speculation. According to verse 17, we'll jump down to verse 17. What do these beasts represent? This is probably the easiest symbol to interpret in this prophecy. You jump down to verse 17. It says, those great beasts which are four are four what? They are four kings which arise out of the earth. And if you're wondering where kingdom comes into this, well, you just have to come down to verse uh, 20. 23. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. So these kings are kings of kingdoms. 
So what do we see in this, in this prophecy? The first thing that we see is we see that there is war and bloodshed happening on the earth in various locations. The nations are restless. We see that represented by the winds. The second thing that we see is we see the great sea represented by, represented by multitudes, nations, kindreds, and tongues. A lot of people. This is happening in a populated area. And then the next thing that we see is we see these beasts representing kingdoms. And what you'll notice is that these kingdoms are coming up at different times. They're not all coming up at once, but they're coming to power at different times and overthrowing the one that came before it. This is what we see happening in this prophecy. Now, another thing that I want to say before we actually get into these animals. Now, I think I was, had too much haste and I jumped ahead and I skipped a point that I shouldn't have skipped. What a preacher should never say, but he's missed a point because nobody knew but me. Now you all know. Um, what you find different in Daniel chapter 7 to Daniel chapter 2 is you actually find that in Daniel chapter 2, you're just dealing with metals, inanimate objects. But what you find in Daniel chapter 7, you find animate objects. You find things with characteristics. And it's from those characteristics you can actually learn more about the natures of these kingdoms. Does that make sense? And so this is another way where we get a different kind of perspective or view on the prophetic sequence of kingdoms all the way through to the end of time. Now the lion with eagle's wings, what does that represent? Babylon. Again, it's following the pattern that we see in Daniel chapter 2 with those links that I've shared before. I actually, I got in the appendix some pictures of the, I guess, an artist's depiction from Simple Truth, if you've ever heard of that before. Um, and it actually captures what these, these animals may have looked like. And so when I did the presentation on Daniel chapter 1, do you remember what I put up on the screen, on the PowerPoint? I put some pictures up. Does anybody remember what some of the pictures were that I put up? Now, a clue, there was a lion in one of them. Yeah, the gates of Ishtar. This was actually, you could call it, you know, the wallabies. The, the national um, animal for their team is the wallaby. <laughs> you could say that um, the kiwis, it's the kiwi. Or is it the silver fern? I don't know what it is. But um, often uh, sporting powers or sporting teams actually have animals that represent their team. The team for Babylon, or the, the animal for Babylon, was the lion with eagle's wings. Daniel would have seen this as he went into Babylon. Um, even throughout the, the Bible, you see various reference, references there, midway through page 3, you see different references in Scripture where Babylon is referred to as a lion. Okay? Um, a lion is noted for its strength, whereas the eagle is famous for the power and the range of its flight. So you're the king of the animals and the king of the air. Now, I jumped ahead and I should have actually read the verse. So let's actually go to verse, to verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. What happened to Babylon? Well, it once was a lion, the king of the beasts, paralleling with that golden head, a great and glorious kingdom. But what happens to this great and glorious kingdom? Well, its wings are cut off or plucked off and it's given not the heart of a lion, that heart of the lion is taken out of it, it's given the heart of a man. Babylon changes. And when you look at the history of Babylon, under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon was strong. It was a superpower. I mean, Babylon was so strong and so glorious that Nebuchadnezzar had time to walk around the tops of his walls and look at the great Babylon that he had built. They've done excavations at Babylon, which is just out of Baghdad in Iraq, and they have found bricks, and stamped in those bricks are the name, is the name of Nebuchadnezzar. You could say that he had a bit of a pride problem. In fact, I've seen those bricks in the British Museum. It's remarkable seeing biblical things in places like that, you know. But Babylon isn't always like that. When Nebuchadnezzar went off the scene, Nabonidus came on. And we know what happened in Daniel chapter 5. What we actually find is weaker kings came along and they actually lost the kingdom as a consequence of their weakness. 
was reduced with the heart of a man, and they had no more taste for conquest. Then we see another power comes to the front. In verse 5, it says, Suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Devour much flesh. This is the Medes and the Persians. Now this is two kingdoms coming together. You're going to see more of this as we jump into Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 actually calls the Medes and the Persians by name. The two kingdoms coming together. They weren't always together. But what I've got in my notes here is actually shows you how they came together. Um, through the 9th, 8th and 7th centuries BC, the kingdom of the Medes was a powerful force in the Near East, constantly threatening the dominant Assyrians. But in the 6th century BC, the up-and-coming kingdom of Persia under Cyrus, have we heard of Cyrus before? So the king Cyrus, or the leader Cyrus, he succeeded in conquering the Medes and fusing them into a combined Mede, media persian empire. Now, it's interesting, this bear has what in its mouth? Three ribs. What does that communicate to you? Now, we're looking at a kingdom that concerns beasts. If you see a beast with ribs from another beast in its mouth, what has that beast just done? It's just eaten three other beasts. What are the beasts, what are the powers that the Medes and the Persian conquered as they came to prominence? Well, the first one was Lydia in Anatolia, or ancient Turkey, in 547 BC. The next one was Babylon, in 539 BC. And the third one was Egypt, in 525 BC. Again, church, these things were written before they happened. They weren't written after the fact. And so the... You see how different the the silver is to the characteristics of animals? It's deepening our understanding here, giving us new highlights that we hadn't seen before. Third kingdom is the kingdom of Greece. Greece. So the first kingdom is the, the lion with the eagle's wings. The second one is the bear with three ribs in its mouth, and it's raised up on one side because the Persians were stronger than the Medes. And you see this again in Daniel chapter 8 when you see the Medes and the Persians depicted. You see two horns, but one is higher than the other. Daniel is a truly remarkable book. Then we come to this third power, which is a leopard, and you see this in verse 6. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Leopards are fast animals. I mean, cats are fast animals, particularly if you couple that with wings. If Babylon was a fast-moving power that conquered nations, if this one is depicted as a leopard with not just two wings on its back but four, what do you think that's telling us? This is a very speedy, conquering power. And that's exactly what it was under the Grecian king or the Macedonian king, Alexander the Great. If you look at history here, um, I've got a bit of an explanation here. So this is at the top of page four. Um, It says, although the leopard is itself a swift creature, its natural agility seems inadequate to describe the amazing speed of Alexander's conquest. The symbolic vision represented the animal with wings added to it, not two, but four, denoting superlative speed. The symbol must fittingly describe, sorry, I I typed some of these ones up. Oh, I didn't type this one up. Um, The symbols most fittingly describes the lightning speed with which Alexander and his Macedonians in less than a decade came into possession of the greatest empire the world had yet known. There is no other example in ancient times of such a rapid movement of troops on so large and successful a scale. Now you've got to think about what the world was then and what the world is now. It was horseback. It was on foot. And yet he conquered the world further and more than anyone had ever done before. From the homeland of Greece all the way through to the borders of India. Phenomenal. And he did it in under 10 years, I think it was. 
He died when he was 33 years old. I've got two years to go. Like, you imagine doing that by age 33. The Bible predicted, and it's interesting, like, you, you also see this in Daniel chapter 8, you see this goat, and it's swift moving, and it's got a single horn on its head, representing the first king of Greece, Alexander the Great. Some interesting notes, I, I probably could have used this in Daniel chapter 8, but when Alexander's um, armies were actually coming into the eastern area, down to where Judea was in Jerusalem, they actually came into the, they surrounded the city of Jerusalem. And the priests invited them in. Josephus actually records this. And what the priests actually did is they actually showed Alexander the Great from the book of Daniel that there would be a king that would overthrow the Persian Empire. He's like, that's me. Isn't that remarkable? Um, so how did Alexander the Great die? Well, it is said that he died of a fever brought on by a drunken debauch at the age of 33. When asked on his deathbed to whom he would leave the kingdom, he replied to the strongest. Four of his generals divided the empire among themselves. Lysimachus took the north with Thrace and part of Asia Minor. Cassander took the west, including Macedonia and Athens. Seleucus took the east with most of Syria, Mesopotamia and Persia. By Ptolemy took the south, including Egypt and Palestine. They divided it up. How many heads did this leopard have? Four four divisions in the Greek Empire. Again, Bible prophecy is fulfilling itself. Then we come down to the beast that I said before that Daniel just couldn't find any naturally occurring animal to describe it because it was a nondescript animal. It was terrifying. And this is what we see this terrifying beast look like in verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, Dreadful, uh, it had huge iron teeth. There's our parallel with Daniel chapter 2, the iron again. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the ten beasts that were before it, all the beasts, sorry, that were before it. And it had ten horns, a different looking beast. If I had that kind of dream, it'd be more like a nightmare. This beast is different from everything that has come before it and everything that came after it. This is the Roman power. Um, archaeology, just reading this note here just to show how strong the Romans were because you see how it crushes everything in its path. It's a very dominating power like the long iron legs of Rome. Archaeology has given us an excellent example on how apt a description this is of Rome's conquest. On the west side of Jerusalem, there used to be a valley known as the Tyropean Valley. It does not exist today because it was filled in with the debris of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The English archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon made a deep, narrow sounding into this area and found the debris was some 70 feet deep. It's pretty deep. They, they demolished and buried places that they conquered. The Romans virtually swept the site of the old city of Jerusalem clean. Roman engineers were known for their thoroughness in both destruction and construction. In this way, the power crushed and devoured. What did the Romans do to the city of Carthage? They decimated them. And they were intentional in the way that they did that. They didn't want to leave a single trace left of the power that had been a thorn in their side for so long. They wanted to wipe them off the map. They crushed and devoured everything in their path. There's no beast that come up after Rome. But the focus now goes from the beast to the ten what? The ten horns. What do these ten horns represent? We come down to verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. So these ten horns, sorry, come from where? Kingdom of Rome. Rome had expanded itself so much that through internal infighting and excess, etc., etc., 
what you actually find is Rome started to be weakened. And as it was weakened, these barbarian tribes that they had conquered, either there was tribes from the north that moved in and conquered, or the people that they had actually conquered rose up in rebellion against them, and they divided the kingdom off piece by piece by piece. This Rome ceased to exist as an empire in about 476 AD when the Ostrogoths sacked Rome. The eternal city was conquered by these barbarians. The barbarians were at the gate, so to speak. And so these four kings, uh, what did I say four? Oh yeah, the four kings of verse 17 represent the kingdoms. They parallel the four empires of chapter 2. Um, these ten kingdoms repre- ten kings, sorry, represent ten kingdoms. Okay. Um, actually, 476, it wasn't the Ostrogoths, it was the Hurulai, sorry. Apologize for that. Um, I don't want to focus so much on these kingdoms. The main focal point, we had to rush through all that, the main focal point for tonight is the Antichrist, the little horn power. In verse 8, we see this new introduction. There is new information in this prophecy, in the progression of prophecy from Daniel that we haven't seen before. In verse 8, it says, I was considering the horns. Now, what are the horns again? These 10 horns, which is Europe. I was considering these kings of Europe, the divisions of the Roman Empire, the feet of iron and clay, the ten horns. And there was another horn, a little one. You notice how the description of this power was not included in the previous verse? The reason it wasn't included in the previous verse is because it came after the division of Rome. He's looking at these ten kingdoms, these ten horns, and he sees a little one coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking what kind of words? What's another word for pompous? Blasphemous words. If you turn over to page five, we know that this power represents the Roman Catholic Church, state. Um, There are a number of evidences that we have for the Antichrist to back that up. And I've got a listed number of here, but this is not an exclusive, like, inclusive list of every single thing. There's things that I haven't put in here. The main ones that we're touching on here you see included. And so the first clue is that it comes up in Europe and it destroys three kingdoms. And you see that in verse 8. But let's read a little bit more of the text. You kind of see this fleshed out a little bit in verses 19 through to 21. It says, Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast. So which beast is Daniel naturally concerned with the most? It's the fourth one. More detail is given to the fourth one. And the fourth one is the terrifying one that he can't describe. So he wants to know about this particular beast. So he asks the angel, his interpreter, for more information about this beast. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful. That gives you a bit of an understanding as to how Daniel felt about this beast. He was terrified of it. With its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. The only other thing that we see in Daniel trampling and destroying and crushing is the stone that's cut without hands. This is the second thing that's crushing, and it's the kingdom of Rome. And I think that's quite fitting. If God's kingdom is a stone and it crushes and it destroys and like the chaff on the summer threshing floor, and we find that this anti-Christian power is pretending to fulfill a role that belongs to God and God alone. And the ten horns that that were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than its fellows. Now, for the students of Daniel here, in Daniel chapter 8, there's a word that's repeated as you look at the different powers, Medo-Persia through to Papal Rome. And it's great, very great, exceedingly great. These beasts aren't just called four beasts. If you go to verse 3, what are they called? When you see it, call it out. Oh, yeah, I think it's verse 3.
they're great beasts. You come down to this little horn power, it isn't given the title great horn. You come down to verse 20 and it's called greater. And you might think, oh yeah, what's the point of that? There's a significant point to that. This power, this king is greater than all the kings that have gone before it. Is it possible to be greater than the king of Babylon at its zenith? Well, if you're the king of Babylon 2.0, yes. And so what we see is an increase, increase in greatness. And this makes sense because we're going from a political power that's mainly concerned with the conquest of regions and nations to a spiritual power who now thinks that its authority is an authority of God. It's greater than its fellows. And then we'll read verse 21 as well. What does this little horn do? I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. What is the Antichrist doing? Persecuting God's people. That's the point that I made at the start. This is a great controversy theme. This anti-Christian power is attacking God's people, persecuting God's people. How long, God, how long, God, will this power reign? You see this in verse 8. How long until you step in, God, and do something? What is the catalyst that stops this persecuting power? Verse 22. Until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Isn't that really interesting? Like, we often think, oh yeah, the second coming will finish all these things. But isn't it interesting that the power of the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church, it went into captivity, it lost its power at the end of the, um, the 18th century. And then 50 years after that, this judgment took place in heaven. Just as the text says, the Antichrist persecutes God's people, persecutes God's people, and then God says, well, all these false judges, let me set up a true judgment. I don't want to get too far ahead because I'm going to steal stuff from Horace next week. I feel like he's got the better one. I wish I had that one. Um, so the first one is it comes up in Europe and destroys three kingdoms. Okay, we're going to read a little bit of history here. I've written this down because it's going to be far better if I read it than explain it. In AD 533, the Emperor Justinian, so this was the, the Emperor of Rome. Rome had weakened significantly. He had moved, well, they had moved the capital. Constant, Constantine did this to Constantinople. So from Rome to Constantinople, named it after himself. Um, and this is where the, the emperors were. So Emperor Justinian issued from Constantinople, proclaiming the Bishop of Rome head of all the churches in 533 AD. Now, why was this significant? Well, this was the power of the day, saying that the leader of the, the churches in the world is a single man. Do you have issues with that church? I hope you do. Are you still Protestants? Are we still protesting? We have issues with that, don't we? Is a single man the head of the church? In fact, if you look at the book of Acts, there is not single elders in churches. There's not a single elder in church. When you look at the book of Acts, there is elders. It's plural. And so another reason why this is such an issue, if there's a single man at the head of the church and he's the head of all churches, what does that tell you? What happens to churches that do not believe what this church teaches? They're, they're automatically on the outer. This decree arose out of certain theological controversies. So the controversy was a man by the name of Arius, um, and that had to do with the deity of Jesus, and resulted in the emperor confirming to Pope John II the headship of all the churches. Now, this is, the, this is the consequence of this decision. It was far-reaching and it changed the history of the world forever. You know, there's certain moments in history that change the course of it. This was one of those. What happened as a consequence of this? Do you think the bishops of Rome enjoyed this new lease on power? Better believe it. Because for the first time in history, for Christianity, the power of the state became came to be used to root out heretics. Justinian, the reigning Roman emperor in Constantinople, was happy to support the Bishop of Rome in these struggles. 
both for his own political gain and for the gain of the Roman-centered church. For the first time in history, Christians through the state were persecuting Christians. And this anti-Christian power, how many kingdoms did it pluck up? It was three. So you have a church that has the power of the army and he goes after those who believe differently to him. And these kingdoms, the Heruli, they met their fate in 493 AD, the Vandals in Northern Africa in 534 AD, and the Ostrogoths in 538 AD, when their power was broken because they were occupying Rome. So the Ostrogoths weren't fully destroyed until 552, but really the death knell for them was when they were kicked out of the capital of Rome. Um, so they fulfill those first three clues there. They come up in Europe, they destroy three kingdoms, and they come after Europe is established. The second one is that they speak blasphemously. What's that word that we saw repeated time after time? Pompous. Pompous. Actually, in verse 25, you see it again. Three times it uses the word pompous. If the Bible repeats itself three times, what's it trying to communicate? That what I am saying is important. He speaks pompous words. There are so many things I could put in here to actually communicate that point. But I I found something in the SDA Bible commentary that I hadn't come across before. And it's it's from um, Prompta Bibliotheca, translated by Lucius Ferrarius, Papa II. And this is what he says. This is a large encyclopedic work written by the Roman Catholic divine of the 18th century. These are some of the things that were being said. A lot of things have been tempered today. But these are the things that were being said during this time of the Dark Ages. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, as it were, but as it were God and the vicar of God. The Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. The Pope is, as it were, God on earth, sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, king of kings, having plenitude of power, to whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent God, direction not only of the earthly but also of the heavenly kingdom the pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify explain or interpret even divine laws the pope can modify divine laws since his power is not of man but of god he acts as vice guarant of god upon earth with most ample power of binding and loosing his sheep now that's the whole idea of the keys the keys of the kingdom has anyone ever been to the vatican before As you go through the Vatican, or as you go through various churches in your cathedrals and stuff, you'll see these mosaics, and on these mosaics you'll see these depictions of this very event of of Jesus giving the keys of the kingdom to Peter. And what's interpreted in that is that Peter, and subsequently the following popes, have the keys to the kingdom. They can loose on earth and loose in heaven. They have control over the souls of men. Salvation is through the Catholic Church. If you're disconnected from the Catholic Church, you don't have salvation. This is why when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses, actually, on the 31st of October, when he nailed his 95 Theses, well, actually, he probably didn't nail them because the door was iron, but when he put <laughs> his 95 Theses there, do you know what the, as, as it all kind of took place and you know, there was pushback from the church, one of the things that they did to compel people not to sign, side with Luther is they withheld mass. They withheld baptisms or christenings. They withheld weddings. These are the sacraments of the church. And withholding these things, do you know what they're telling, to, telling the laity, the populace? You are cut off from the church, therefore you are cut off from salvation, and if you die, you will burn in hell forever. And so the Catholic Church used this as a means to control. Point F is whatever the Lord God, he, the Lord God Himself and the Redeemer is said to do, that His vicar does, provided that He does nothing according contrary to the faith. Um, there's a number of, I guess, things that we could kind of extrapolate here. I guess one of the main things is point D. That He has so great authority and power that He can modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. Now you're probably going to figure out where we're going to go with this one. The Council of Trent, 
which was a consequence of the Reformation, they made very clear delineation that the church can interpret and change divine laws. God has given the church the authority to do this, even his laws. In fact, even when you have communion, and this is what I love about the Adventist church, the Protestant churches, it's interesting when you go through Europe, you see this stuff so often. You go through, like, you go through the churches in Rome, the various churches, St. Paul's outside the walls, the Vatican, and you go into the church and what do you see? At the very centre of the Catholic church, you see not the pulpit, what's at the very centre? The altar, where sacrament takes place. Then when we would go to Germany, other places, and you would go to the Reformed Church, guess what you would see at the centre of the churches? The pulpit. What's at the centre of this church? The pulpit. Why? Because we emphasise the Word of God. And so at this altar, the priest would come and the priest would play, pray over the emblems of, of, of bread and of wine, transubstantiation, as he prays the prayer. This is teaching, this is their dogma. That as he prays this prayer, he, re- he reenacts the crucifixion of Jesus, the actual blood and the actual body of Jesus. Jesus is being sacrificed again and again and again. We believe that they're symbols. They believe that they're spiritually the, s- the actual body and the actual blood of Jesus. And the priest has the authority to call Jesus down onto that altar. Isn't that wild? The superstition of the dark ages. The next one is that he persecutes God's people. Now, if you come down to verse 25, it says, He shall speak pompous words, we've just dealt with that, against the Most High. Very similar to what Lucifer did, isn't it? I will be like the Most High. I, I, I. He wants to ascend upwards. The Antichrist speaks pompous words against the Most High. Jesus is the object in in which he's trying to, I guess, replicate and take the glory from. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Now, the Dark Ages, you don't have to know much about history to know that the Roman Catholic Church has done a significant amount of persecuting throughout history. The Waldenses, the Albigensians, the, um, the Crusades, Spanish Inquisition, all of these things from the moment that they were given the ability to exercise not only the spiritual sword, but the physical sword, they used the, the, the physical sword. Particularly for the Waldenses. Now, why do you think that they were so upset with the Waldenses? The Waldenses, their claim was that they were the primitive Christians holding the primitive dog, dogmas and doctrines of Christianity. Now, if you were a church that believes that they received the keys to the kingdom after Jesus' death and resurrection, and you believe that you were the first church and the only church, if there is another church that has, I guess, earlier beginnings than yours, but yet they believe different things to you, they're a threat. And so the Waldenses were persecuted. I read Wiley's book. If you're interested in what happened to the Waldenses in their history, there's a book by Wiley, He's, a, he's an old Reformed um, minister, Presbyterian minister. Ellen White quotes him a number of times in The Great Controversy. I encourage you to read that book. It is an interesting read. It is a sobering read. And then when you couple that with what Ellen White says of The Great Controversy, that the church has not changed, it adds even more force to that. So, Wiley. W-Y-L-I-E. It's a good book. I recommend it. Um, The fourth clue is that it intends to change times and law. In verse 25, it says that he intends to change time and law. You notice that it doesn't say that he changes times and law. He intends to or he thinks to. In fact, the NIV, I love the rendering in the NIV. The NIV says he tries to change. Isn't that cool, hey? He tries to, but he doesn't succeed. He tries to change the times and laws. Now, isn't it interesting that you have these laws, but it also, I guess, focuses not just on the laws, the Ten Commandments, but it focuses also on the times. 
which is the only one of the commandments that has to do with time? Sabbath. So Scripture emphasizes that it's not just the ten, but there's a particular one in the ten that is at threat, and that's Sabbath. In fact, if you want to go to your appendix for a bit, which is on page seven, I found these in my study. These are quotes on Sunday from Protestants. Now, the first one is from a man by the name of uh, Edward T. Hiscock. He was a Baptist scholar and a theologian who authored the Baptist Manual. And he was addressing a group of ministers in the late 1800s. And this is what he says. What a pity that it comes branded. Talking about Sunday here. Sunday worship. What a pity that it comes branded with the mark of paganism, Christians, with the name of the Son God, when adopted and sanctioned by the papal apostasy, and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. But yet we still do it. Isn't that wild, hey? And so the question ultimately comes, what's your authority? Is it what God has said, or is it what's traditional and been passed on? The next one is this, by Eusebius who was a church historian during the time of Constantine, which was in the 300s. He says, All things, whatever it was, our duty to do on the Sabbath, these we have transferred to the Lord's day. Isn't that wild? We have transferred this to the Lord's day. And then this is by a man by the name of Melanchthon, which was Luther's understudy. And now this has been translated in 1545. And so you've got the old English in it, so I'm going to do my best. He changeth the times and laws, this is talking about the Antichrist, that any of the six work days commanded commanded of God will make the unholy and idle days when he, I don't know what that means, L-Y-S-T-E, or of their own holy days abolished make work days again, or when they change Saturday into Sunday. So in other words, it's saying, he changed that. Antichrist changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. Isn't it? Like Boris was sharing this last week, and I thought it was a really good point, and we're almost done, guys. Boris was sharing this last week about how they change. And I've seen, um, seen preachers share this before, and I think that it, it does match when it says that he shall change times and laws. It's not just focusing on the Sabbath commandment to do with time, but also the prophetic interpretations of prophecy. Because as a consequence of Martin Luther nailing those 95 theses to the church door at at Wittenberg, it was so obvious. And I'll tell you why it was so powerful what what the Protestant church was saying and doing. Because it wasn't just we think. It's Daniel 7 says. Prophecy says that you are the Antichrist. And how do I know that? I was going to put some pictures up on the screen. I forgot about it. But you can go to the Rathaus in Nuremberg. And you can, which is the courthouse. And as you go into the courthouse, you have the arches above the door. And in the archways above the door, you have the lion with eagle's wings and Nebuchadnezzar on one side. Then you have the Persian bear with three ribs in its mouth and the Persian king Cyrus. On the other entrance, you have the leopard with four heads and, and four wings. And you have Alexander the Great, the one next to it. You have Caesar with this terrible looking beast with seven horns, and there's a little horn in the middle that has a face on it. What's significant about that? That was in the 1500s. Lots of people were illiterate. So how did the message get conveyed? Well, if you're going to the courthouse, which was a main meeting place in town, you would see these prophetic depictions on the, up on the archways as you went in. And so what's, what, did the, what did the Roman church do to try to deflect from this? Well, there was Jesuit interpretations when it came to prophecy. No, 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 all the prophecies were fulfilled in the past, so it can't be us. Or all the prophecies were fulfilled in the, the, the future, so it can't be us. And the, the, ref, the Protestant church said, no, you are this power. In the church office, we have a Bible from the late 1800s. And the commentary is written by a reformed preacher underneath it. You know, one of those big family Bibles? It's massive. And you read the commentary, particularly concerning Revelation chapter 18. And I tell you what, he does not hold back. The great whore, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots. He just fully lays into it. You wouldn't hear that today. 
You wouldn't hear that today from those churches. It is very interesting that they have adopted the arguments that the papal church was pushing forward in the 1500s to deflect from the accusations that they were antichrist. They have adopted Jesuit understandings of prophetic interpretation. Isn't that wild, hey? And then, like, that Bible out there in the office, near that Bible is a book called The Great Controversy. And at the same time, when this reformed preacher was writing his commentary, which was so straight and so like, you read that and it'll put hairs on your chest. And then you read the great controversy and you read the great controversy and she says that the apostate churches, the fallen churches will unite with the beast. And you consider her day and what it was like. Protestants and Catholics did not get on. The Christian landscape has changed dramatically. Now, I'll tell you why. Protestant churches have stopped protesting and they've gone back to their mother. And the last thing, but not the most, it's definitely not the most unimportant thing, it rains for 1,260 days and according to last week, 1,260 days is 1,260 years. And you see, I guess, the explanation of this, it uses the text times, times and half a time in verse 25. So how do you get 1,260 days or years out of this? Well, you just have to go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, um, and Revelation 12, and verse 6. And you see that it talks about the very same thing, but then it uses a different time period. One uses time, times, and half a time, borrowing from Daniel chapter 7. The other one uses 1,260 days. It's talking about the same thing, but it uses the different time period. So we can see that these things are linked. And so 1,260 years, this power will be a persecuting power on earth. That began in 538 AD when the Ostrogoths were kicked out of Rome as a consequence of the Emperor Justinian giving the, the Bishop of Rome troops to persecute dissenters. 1,260 years from that point of time takes us all the way to 1798 when Napoleon's general Berthier marched to Rome, took Pope Pius off his throne and took him into exile where he died a year and a half later. 1,260 years, just as the Bible predicted. So, I'm going to close with this question. What is God's response to all of these false judgments? Well, he sets up a true judgment. It's called the investigative judgment. And it is good news. It is great news. People... Some people today will tell you that it's terrible news or that it is anti-gospel. I'll tell you what, it's nothing but the gospel and it is good news. And how do we know it's good news? Well, we've seen everything that's come before and it's terrible news. But God will step in, God will intervene, God will deliver and God will be glorified and he will deliver his saints. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you are in control that even though the world seems to be out of control, there is a God who sits on his throne, who sees all things and knows all things. Father, we have nothing to be worried about in the judgment if we have Jesus. And Father, we ask and pray that you may come soon to take us home. But in the meantime, Lord, we ask and pray that you may protect us from the evil one. Father, we look at human history and we know that there are times that have been far worse than today, significantly worse. We think of the old Denzies, Lord. We think of the early church. We think of the Huguenots. We think of those Christians who have been persecuted all across the globe right now. Father, we have it so easy. But Father, we just ask and pray that you may do in our hearts what needs to be done, that you might prepare us for that great day. That we may look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That we may trust in him who is just and that who has a way and that will deliver his people even to the end, Lord. We ask and pray that you may bless us here this evening, and we have confidence in you and your word. There's not just some dead letter, but it's living, it's alive. It foresaw the future before the future came, and it's forewarned us of the things that will take place. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So it was interesting as I was doing my study of this, um, looking at, I guess, what happened in five 
533 AD when Justinian gave the decree for the Bishop of Rome. He connected church and state, which is interesting. He connected these two two things together and any dissenters were persecuted. You, You look at Revelation 13 and it happens again. But this time it's a little bit different because there's a new player on the block here and that's the United States of America. But they do the same thing in a global way. What has happened before will happen again but it will bring this whole thing to an end. Because remember, at the heart of this whole thing is this thing called the great controversy. But God's the one who wins in the end. And that's, that's good enough for me. But yeah, if you go to the great controversy and you read those chapters, the impending conflict, I think it is, or Sunday laws, or if you read those chapters and you th- read them I- with this in mind, you will see the parallels significantly. Because what has happened before will happen again.